is central to the whole course, um, namely how to describe the shape of a manifold. And it's also uh, the essay topic. So let us remember how, so far, we are describing the shape of a manifold. <coughs> we are doing that by knowing about distances. That's why we introduced the metric on a manifold. There's a long history of this approach to capturing the shape of a manifold. Consider, for example, a shape uh, like a potato. It's like two-dimensional surface and curve. Draw a triangle on that surface which has a right angle in it. In general, for that triangle, because there's curvature, we will not have that Pythagoras is true. Lengths are behaving non-trivially. That's one way of detecting that there's curvature in the underlying space. Another way to detect the presence of curvature is to check the sum of the angles. In general, it won't be 180 degrees if there's curvature. It could be larger, it could be smaller than 180 degrees. Those thoughts are actually quite old, and Gauss and Helmholtz already considered the possibility that our three-dimensional space might be curved. And they even started some experiments. Of course, they were not accurate enough to measure it. But in principle, they could have measured um, that space is curved. They didn't anticipate yet that space-time could be curved, too. Um, but they definitely considered the possibility that space would be curved. By the way, do you know what curvature is between space and time? Any intuition for that? It's expansion. Expansion is... Uh, curvature between space and time. But we will get to that a little later. Yeah? Did they already have a notion of geodesic? Well, they didn't have Riemannian geometry. I, I suppose they had intuitive notions, but I don't think they had the equations for it. It seems like I, mean, I could draw a triangle made up of non-geodesics just on, on a plane that wouldn't uh, would violate these things, right? Yeah. Geodesic triangles violated. That's right. That's the non-trivial part. You can always draw triangles with lines that are not straight, even though they could be straight because it's a plane. Yeah. Now, so in, in principle, we have so far been pursuing the strategy of capturing the shape of a manifold by capturing the non-triviality of distances. The metric, it knows about distances. It knows about infinitesimal distances, but that can be used, as we will see later on in this course, to build up a calculation of longer distances too. So you can check, for example, whether Pythagoras is true or not for geodesic um, <clears throat> lines that form a triangle. So our strategy so far has been that we, that we consider a metric tensor, which gives us infinitesimal distances, from which we get finite distances, from which, in principle, we can infer what the shape is. There are alternative ideas, though. And I'm pointing out alternative ideas for several reasons. I mean, one is that there's different mathematics behind it. But also, we still don't know for sure how to quantize gravity. Which way of capturing shape, which way of capturing curvature is the best to quantize gravity? Nobody knows. Some would try to quantize the metric. Others would say, no, I, I quantize the idea that the sum of the angles may not be 180 degrees. That is another way, it's another path towards quantum gravity. And here is yet another idea. And we will get some more ideas later on in this course. And of course, the essay topic is to give an overview and maybe focus on one or the other method. So an alternative idea to distances is this. A manifold shape, that is its curvature, is also revealing itself by the fact that it implies, curvature implies non-triviality of parallel transport. 
So imagine this is the Earth, and that is the North Pole. You're looking on the Earth from, so to speak, the top, looking down on the North Pole. And let's say this outer line here is the equator. And imagine that you are standing at the North Pole, and you're pointing in some arbitrary direction towards the equator. You have no choice. Every direction goes towards the equator. So you're pointing in some direction. You're standing on the North Pole, pointing in some direction. Let's say you're standing here, you're pointing in this direction. You've made your choice, choose the direction. <clears throat> and, then, and then you walk towards the equator. Maybe not all the way. You just walk towards some latitude while always pointing in the same direction with your hand. And then once you arrived at a certain latitude, then you walk sidewards. And as you walk sidewards, you're not turning around. You're not on purpose changing the direction in which you're pointing. And then you walk sidewards this way, and then you walk backwards up to the North Pole. As you arrive back at the North Pole, you're no longer pointing in the same direction. That would not have happened on a flat manifold. You can take any arbitrary path, and when you return on a flat manifold, you will still be pointing in the same direction if you've faithfully parallel transported your arm all the way. But on a curved manifold, that's not the case. So by checking for the non-triviality of parallel transport, we can also capture curvature. So let us now develop that machinery, how to capture curvature through non-triviality of parallel transport. Ultimately, this should capture just the same thing as the metric did. And so later on, we will make a connection between the metric description and the parallel transport description. But for now, we don't need a metric. We will only try to encode the idea that we have a notion of parallel transport and then ask, how can that be non-trivial? Just a sec. Um, so for that purpose, oh, for that purpose, we will introduce the so-called covariant differentiation. Now you may wonder, why don't we use the Lie derivative? You see, with the Lie derivative, we can differentiate vectors. And we have a directional derivative. So why don't we just use the directional derivative? Um, the Lie derivative, to parallel tr transport into the, in one direction, then parallel transport in the other direction, and then backwards, etc., and check how much uh, a vector might have, might have changed, and doesn't that capture the curvature? No, it doesn't. The Lie derivative, if you remember, we introduced before we even had a metric. The Lie derivative is completely insensitive to a metric. It doesn't know about the shape. A manifold. It's a directional derivative, all right, but it's a dumb one. It's, it doesn't know the shape of the manifold. So in particular, choose, for example, one vector field, one direction field, to be the direction xi. So it's the direction vector d by dxi. Another vector field to be in the direction d by dxj then remember that the commutator between two Lie derivatives, so you parallel transport in this direction, then that direction, and then backwards, the commutator between two Lie derivatives is the Lie derivative of the commutator of the two vector fields. But those two vector fields actually commute with each other. So that's actually zero. So actually the, the Lie derivative, this direction, that direction, that direction, that direction, the commutator of it, is actually vanishing for those guys no matter what shape the manifold has. So the Lie derivative is not um, what we need here. We need a new kind of derivative. Yes, another kind of derivative. And it's going to be derivation two. <clears throat> On all tensors, not just differential forms. Um, so the covariant differentiation is what we need. Here's the abstract definition. A covariant derivative is a linear map which takes two tangent vectors in two tangent vectors, in two tangent vector, or two tangent vector fields in two tangent vector field. One tangent vector's role 
is to indicate in which direction we want to differentiate, in which direction we want to parallel transport. We want to know how much does a vector change as I'm parallel transporting it in the direction of a vector. So one of the two vectors that go into a covariant derivative is the vector that's going to be infinitesimally parallel transported, and we want to know how much it changes. And the other vector is indicating in which direction we are doing the parallel transport. So far, this is all abstract definitions, and um, it's not clear why this would have to do with parallel transport. I will try to make that clear later on. Let's just start with the abstract um, algebraic definition first, so that we know what we have, mathematically speaking, and then we look for the geometric interpretation. OK, so a, a covariant derivative is a linear map that takes two tangent vectors as its input and gives us a tangent vector as its output. Intuitively, one is going to give us the direction in which we want to differentiate, and the other is the vector field that is being covariantly differentiated, that is, of which we want to know how much it changes by which vector it changes as we parallel transport it in the direction of the first vector. The axioms that we require of a covariant derivative are these. <clears throat> we want that the covariant derivative of a vector field eta in the direction of a vector field xi multiplied with some function should be linear in that function. So if there's a function a scalar valued function in front of the direction vector that indicates in which direction we want to differentiate, then that should be just linear. We should just be able to pull that out. And that just indicates the idea that psi tells us in which direction we differentiate, and, and only that. So it should be completely linear in, in this variable. On the other hand, we want this to be a derivative. So we want it, uh, well, a directional derivative. So we want it to obey a, Leib a Leibniz rule, a product rule. That's the second axiom. So a linear map of this kind, which obeys that axiom and the Leibniz rule that um, the covariant derivative in the direction of psi of a vector field multiplied with the scalar function Notice, now the f is here, not there, multiplied with the scalar function. That ought to be <coughs> um, the covariant derivative acting on the f, leaving the eta the same, plus leaving the f the same and acting with the covariant derivative on the eta. So we have the first term, covariant derivative acting on f, Covariant derivative acting on f, well, that's a directional derivative on a function. But there's really little choice. The directional derivative on a function, we want to be the directional derivative on a function, the evaluation of the vector field on the function. Right? Remember that vector fields are directional derivatives. The whole thing is going to be a generalization of directional derivative for tensors. And for functions, the directional derivative is simply the application of the, of the vector field. We keep that. So we have here the application of the uh, direction vector field onto the function. That's the covariant derivative in the direction of psi of the function as well, leaving the eta the same, plus leaving the function the same, and then the covariant derivative acting on, on eta in the direction of psi. OK. So we want the product rule. We want linearity in the direction. And we legislate that the covariant derivative acting on a function is just the ordinary derivative acting on a function. Right? Covariant derivative of a function in the direction of psi is psi applied to f. Such a structure is called a covariant derivative or also affine connection. For now, let's assume that a metric has not yet been specified. Later on, we will have to see how they are compatible, an affine connection, a covariant derivative, on one hand, and the metric on the other hand. They are supposed to describe the same shape. Right? So, but for now, we don't need the metric. This is, we are pursuing here an alternative description of the shape. 
remember, in principle, you could pursue, I don't know if that makes sense in physics, but you could take a differentiable manifold and put a shape on it by putting a certain metric on it, and then also putting a, another shape on it using an affine connection, if you wanted to. It could be a sphere with respect to one description, and it could be an ellipsoid or a potato with, this script, with respect to the other um, thing, <clears throat> with, the other, um, with respect to the affine connection. So how does this look like in a chart? If we have a realization of these axioms, if we have such a map, Nabla, then how does it look like in a chart? Well, let's choose bases in the um, tangent space. And in a chart, that would be a natural choice of bases. We don't have to choose that basis, and later on we will choose others. But let's just, let's just say we choose this basis that comes along with the coordinate system. Then how does the given covariant derivative, how does it given affine connection, act on these basis vectors. So an affine connection takes one tangent vector as input to decide in which direction to differentiate, and another tangent vector as the one that is to be differentiated, whose change under, parallel under infinitesimal parallel transport is to be calculated. The output of that the output of the covariant derivative of that vector field in the direction of this vector field is going to be a vector field again, right? Because the change of a vector is a vector. <coughs> and abstractly, because, because of this, two vectors in, one vector out. So we know that this expression must be a linear combination of these basis vectors again. So there must exist some coefficient functions with indices k to contract these basis vectors, but also depending on which vectors we choose here, so i and j. So there must exist some coefficient functions for a given affine connection, such that this equation holds. These coefficient functions are called the Christoffel symbols. And notice that they are what exactly they are will depend on what bases we choose in the tangent space. So they are called the Christoffel symbols or also the connection coefficients. Now, once we have that, we can calculate what the action of an affine connection is on any arbitrary vector field. So once we know what the FN connection does to these basis vector fields, then we can calculate using the axioms, namely linearity in this argument and product rule for that argument, we can calculate what the action is for all vector fields. Let's try it out. So xi is some arbitrary vector field, eta is some arbitrary vector field. The FN connection of it is given by this. Affine connection, I just spelled out what the xi is. I just spelled out what the eta is. Remember that xi, the xi i are coefficient functions. The etas are coefficient functions. Very important thing to keep in mind here. This is a vector. That is a vector. This is a scalar. These are scalar coefficient functions. These are scalar coefficient functions, right? <clears throat> OK, so we use the axioms now to simplify this. One of the first axioms said that we have linearity in these prefactors. That's an example of an F, right? We have linearity in this. So we can just pull this in front of the covariant derivative. That was easy. So we have just pulled that in front. On the other hand, we have the Leibniz rule for a product of arguments in here. And what do we actually have here? We have scalar coefficient functions and we have vectors. So what we have to work out now is how the covariant derivative acts on this product of these scalar coefficient functions and these vectors. So I'm carrying forward the xi. And then what is this doing here? Remember, the covariant derivative has to act on this product. So it has to act on this, leaving that invariant, plus we get a term where this is left the same, and we have the covariant derivative acting on that. 
So psi i, carrying this forward. Then covariant derivative acting on eta, leaving this derivative the same. So I'm carrying this forward. But we have the covariant derivative acting on the coefficient function, which is just the ordinary derivative. Remember that the covariant derivative on functions is the ordinary derivative. So it's eta j comma i, just the ordinary derivative, d by dx i, d by dx i of eta j. And this one was carried forward. Plus, by the Leibniz rule, we get a term where the eta j is untouched. And we have to covariantly differentiate this vector field here. So in this case, we have the xi i carried forward. This is untouched, also carried forward. And we have the covariant derivative of this basis vector field acting on, I mean, covariant derivative of this basis vector field in the, differentiated in the direction of that vector field. And this is because of the equation in the box that. Okay, so from our axioms, we obtain um, this expression for the general covariant derivative of a vector field. Um, and then putting the xi uh, inside, we have xi uh, eta differentiated plus xi eta not differentiated, and then we have the gamma symbols here. At this point, we introduce a convenient notation. See, this expression here comes up quite a bit, especially, um, especially this, the eta comma i and then eta with the Christoffel symbol. This is an ordi ordinary differentiation plus something to do with the Christoffel symbols. That thing comes up a lot. It's the coefficients of the covariant derivative. And so we introduced the notation of a semicolon now. You've hopefully all seen this notation before. So we... Um, have that the coefficients of a covariantly differentiated uh, vector field. Uh, the, this coefficient, a semicolon i, defined in this way, um, is simply that expression here, and it allows us to write the covariant derivative of eta in the direction of xi in this very convenient way. The xi, if remember, we have linearity in the coefficient functions xi i, so we can pull the xi i's in front of it all. And then the differentiation that's happening on the eta uh, is this differentiation here with the semicolon, which consists of an ordinary differentiation and um, the Christopher symbol term. Keep that thing in mind. We, we use that all the time. We will sometimes use the notation with the nabla to indicate a covariant differentiation when we talk about the actual vector fields, when we are interested only in the coefficient functions, then we will use the semicolon. And this is the relationship between using semicolons and using the nabla. This is for coefficient functions. This is for the abstract vectors. So we will freely move between the one and the other notation. And what's in the box is the translation between the two. So we have coefficient functions. And we have the Christoffels, we have the Christoffel symbols. Now coefficient functions of tensors, of vectors and covectors and tensors in general, have particular transformation rules when we go with the when we go from the basis of one coordinate system to the canonical basis of another coordinate system. The Christoffel symbols don't. They are special kinds of coefficient functions, they are unusual, not special, they are unusual. And that's because the Christopher symbols are not themselves the coefficient functions of a tensor. Let's check this. Let's say we change chart from using variables x to variables x bar. When we change chart in this way, and we change basis in the tangent vectors, the same uh, along with that, from d by dx i to d by dx bar i, then how do the coefficients gamma change? Well, on one hand, we have that when we express everything in the bar coordinate system, then we have the nabla in the direction of d by dx bar <coughs> a, d by dx bar b, 
It's given by some barred Christopher symbols. We don't know yet exactly what they are, but they, they will exist, uh, contracted with these basis vectors. I mean, an equation like that must hold in any chart. So in particular for the barred chart, and then there will be some barred um, Christopher symbols. We can express this um, partial derivative also in terms of um, the d by dx with this chain rule factor. Let's keep that equation in mind, call it equation one. There's another way to evaluate this expression here, namely using the axioms of a covariant derivative. So here we have the same expression, but now we express d by dx bar as chain rule factor times d by dx. And here we express as well d by dx bar b, we express as chain rule factor times d by dx without the bar. And you see, now we have a basis vector and coefficient functions in front, a basis vector and coefficient functions in front. We can work this out <clears throat> by the first axiom of an affine connection. We have linearity in any coefficient functions here. We can just pull them in front. So let's do this. This factor gets just pulled in front. It's in front of everything here. But now we still have to evaluate the covariant derivative acting on this product here, where remember this is a vector, but that's a coefficient function. By the Leibniz rule, we have the covariant derivative acting on the coefficient function times this left alone, plus the covariant derivative not acting on that, leaving it alone, and differentiating that. Where the covariant derivative acting on a function is just the ordinary derivative. It's just the evaluation of a vector field. <clears throat> so we have this just carried forward. And then by the product rule, we have this acting on that as the ordinary derivative, d by dx i, d by dx i on that, because covariant derivative on a function is ordinary derivative. We carry that forward. And then by the product rule, we have to carry this forward unchanged and have the derivative, the covariant derivative act on that. So we carry this forward. And then we have the covariant derivative in this direction of that vector field, and that's just given by the Christoffel symbol contracted with these basis vectors. Now, look at this. We have here dxi by dx bar a, d by dxi. You see, this is a chain rule factor for that. So overall, the combination of these two is simply d by dx bar a. So we can write it as that d by d x bar a, and that thing carried forward. And also from here to there, I've multiplied this through to here. Now let's compare equation one, uh, two with the equation one. Both give us the same thing. Both express that. So we have that this, this thing here is that thing here. You see, this relates the gamma bar to the gamma, but in a highly non-trivial way. We can express the gamma, the gamma bar in terms of the gamma, obviously by simply just dividing through by, by these coefficients. But it won't be linear. If we put equations one and two together, we have that this expression is that. And so we just divide through by this chain rule factor here. I mean, it multiply with the inverse matrix, really. And then we have that the Christopher symbols in the new chart of the x bar is given by the Christopher symbols in the old chart without a bar. So this transformation rule. Now, if gamma were a tensor, if the gamma coefficient functions, where the coefficient functions of a tensor, presumably a one-fold contravariant and two-fold covariant tensor, then the transformation rule 
should be exactly this one without that term. It should be just this way, where the upper index gets multiplied with this matrix and the lower indices get multiplied with those change of charge matrices. That would have been exactly as expected for a tensor field. But the Christopher symbols don't transform that way. They have these extra terms here too. And they are very different. You see, there's not even a gamma in there. That cannot be a tensor for a simple reason. If a tensor is zero in one coordinate system, it's zero in all coordinate systems. Not so with the Christopher symbols. You see, if gamma is, if, if all those coefficients are zero in one coordinate system, even everywhere in that coordinate system, then simply by changing coordinate system, you can arrive at the gamma bar, which has non-zero coefficients all over the place. See, this might be zero, but these things have no reason to be zero when you change coordinates. This will describe, this phenomenon describes pseudo-forces. You can have flat space-time, Minkowski space, and yet non-zero gammas. And that's what you get when you are in non-trivial coordinate systems. If you choose polar coordinates, spherical coordinates, or an accelerated coordinate system, then you get non-trivial gammas. And they arise this way, from the transformation from Minkowski rectangular coordinates to the non-trivial spherical coordinates or even accelerated coordinates. You get these terms, and that makes your derivatives, your covariant derivatives, non-trivial then. They still describe flat space, of course, but now you have pseudo-forces. So let's keep this in mind for later, that the Christopher symbol, the affine connection, is not a tensor. We will find out later what exactly it is. Now, um, this, in Einstein's days, this was also the definition of what Christopher symbols are. They were not defined through the two axioms of linearity in the first argument and product rule for the main argument. The Christopher symbols were or an affine connection, a covariant derivative was defined as anything that obeys that equation in the box, these transformation rules. Just like in those days, uh, a tangent vector, a cotangent vector, and general tensors were defined as things whose coefficient functions had particular transformation rules. And these were the defining transformation rules for a Christopher symbol. This, e this equation, by the way, is not, it's really back from the old days, because remember that we are here always choosing the bases in the tangent space that come along with the coordinate system. If, for example, you change coordinates, but you don't change the bases in your tangent spaces, and then the gammas don't transform at all. Right? So keep that in mind. <clears throat> this is tied to a particular choice of bases in the tangent spaces, namely this, the, the bases that comes with the coordinates. OK, now here is um, a slight refinement of the notion of covariant derivatives, but it's really conceptually quite trivial. It's the absolute covariant derivative, nabla. And notice that in distinction to what we had earlier, there's no longer a xi here. Nabla with xi was covariant differentiation in the direction of xi. But the absolute covariant derivative doesn't have a particular direction vector. That's the point. What if we do not make up our mind yet in which direction we want to covariantly differentiate? That's what the absolute covariant derivative does. You're differentiating, but you leave open in which direction you want to evaluate that covariant derivative. So the absolute covariant derivative takes as its input only one 
vector field because you have not made up your choice yet for which, um, in which direction you want to differentiate. So it takes only one vector field as input, the one that you want to differentiate, and as output it will give you a tensor field that is both one-fold covariant and one-fold contravariant. It's one-fold contravariant because that's what the output of a covariant derivative is, but it's also one-fold covariant because it has one open slot, one covariant index, one open slot, so that you can feed another vector field to actually make it the usual covariant derivative, once you've made up your mind which direction you want to differentiate in. So this is just the open slot for putting in the direction vector field later on. So the absolute covariant derivative is mapping a vector field eta, expanded in this way for example, into uh, the covariant, absolute covariant derivative of it, and it is going to be given by the covariant derivatives coefficient tensor times dxi tensor d by dx um, k. Why is that doing the trick? I mean, clearly it is obeying the condition that it's mapping a vector field into a one-fold covariant, one-fold contravariant tensor field. You see one-fold contravariant, one-fold covariant, and here we have the indices, eta k semicolon i. Well, let's try it out. If we apply this expression to a direction vector field, so if we feed it a direction vector field into that slot, are we going to get back the covariant derivative in the direction of that direction vector field? So this is the absolute covariant derivative. I haven't chosen a direction yet in which to differentiate. Now we choose a direction, xi. Let's plug that xi into this. We can because this has a covariant slot. So we apply the absolute covariant derivative of eta onto psi by feeding psi into the covariant slot. So we write down this expression that we had here, this one, and then into the covariant slot we put the psi, the direction vector field. And what is that? Well, it's d by it's dxi applied to psi i d by dxi, and remember there's a Kronecker delta between the dual bases, the two dual bases, and we just left with the coefficients psi i. So we carry this forward. From this evaluation, only the psi i survive, and um, the dxi gets eaten up by, by the d by dx j here, and we're just left with that expression, which is indeed from the equation in the red box, this is the coefficient uh, written out in, in explicit coefficients what the abstract covariant derivative is. <coughs> Let me show you the equation in the box again. Here it is. The covariant derivative of a vector field eta in the direction of psi is given by the semicolon derivative coefficients given here contracted with the xi i, and these are the basis vectors, that's what we arrived at here. Okay, so that's the absolute covariant derivative. All of this was algebraically defined. We said that anything, any linear map um, that obeys these two axioms, linearity in the direction and product rule in the main argument is called a covariant derivative. But what's the geometric meaning of this? We set out to encode the idea of parallel transport. And the covariant derivative's job was to calculate how a vector is changing direction by another vector how a vector is changing direction as it is being parallel transported. That's what the covariant derivative is supposed to do. <clears throat> so we need now the notion of parallel transport. Here's the definition. Assume we are given an affine connection. We are given a covariant derivative. 
Now, choose a path, gamma, in the manifold. It's the manifold, here's a path, gamma, here's a point P. And let us ask, under which condition will we say that a vector field, which will, of course, have vectors here, will have a vector there, will have a vector there, will have a vector there. Under which condition will we say that the vector field has vectors assigned to those points which are parallel translates of each other. Okay, so if, if this is a curved manifold, it has some potato shape or whatnot, um, then there's going to be some notion of parallel transport intuitively. We want to put it into exact math now. And if you start with a particular vector here, and th then there is a well-defined notion of parallel transporting that vector along the path. Under which condition will we say that a particular vector field has vectors assigned to those points which are parallel translates of another along that path? Here's the definition for that. Um, a tangent vector field eta is called autoparallel along that path. And by that we mean that the vectors, the tangent, the, that the vectors of the vector field at these points on the path are parallel translates of each other. So we say the vector field is autoparallel along the path if the covariant derivative of the vector field in the direction along the path in the direction of gamma dot, if gamma is the path. So if these are the tangent vectors along the path, if that is vanishing. Okay, that, that was the whole idea of what a covariant derivative should do. A covariant derivative should tell us how much a vector is changing as we parallel transport it. If a vector field is not changing at all, then we're saying it's parallel transported. It does not change. It's parallel transported along the path. It turns out that when you have defined, when you define a covariant derivative through the Christopher symbols and all that, once you've defined a covariant derivative, then through this definition, you have defined parallel transport. And the reason is that given a covariant derivative, given a vector, this equation tells you what the neighboring vectors have to be such that they are parallel transported according to the affine connection. And this comes from the theory of ordinary differential equations that you can always uh, integrate that equation at least some finite amount. So the overall logic is, we start with defining an affine connection, and then the affine connection allows us, through this definition, to specify what parallel transport of a vector field is. And once we have that, we can check whether a manifold is curved or not, for example, by doing the parallel transport on, you know, Trans transport in some direction, parallel transport in another direction, and eventually come back. If whenever you do an excursion while you parallel transport and you come back and the vector hasn't changed, then no curvature. See, this can happen even when the Christoffel symbols are not zero. Remember, you know, it, you can always use a coordinate system in which the Christoffel symbols are not zero. But even in that case, I mean, in that case, when there's no curvature, but the Christopher symbols are not zero, the parallel transport should come out trivial, even though the gammas are not zero. The parallel transport should come out to be trivial. Okay, so how exactly does that look like? This condition here, the condition that the vectors of a vector field have covariant derivative zero along the tangent um, along in, in the direction of the tangent vectors to a path. So the parallel transporting of 
of a vector field, how does that look like? Well, we can write the vector field as usual in this way with a coefficient function. We write the path as a map from some interval uh, from A to B into the manifold. So the path is a map of real numbers t, we can think of them as the time, into positions in the manifold. Then the tangent vector, if you remember from the geometric definition of a tangent vector, tangent vector is gamma dot, it's the derivative of the path directly, and you can write it as d by dt, or dxk by dt, d by dxk. Coefficient functions times basis vectors. That's another way of writing down what the tangent vector is. So now the condition of a vector field being autoparallel to a path, so the condition for the vectors to be parallel translates of another along that path, is that this is equal to zero. And let's spell this out now. So the gamma dot is here. So we plug that in here. It's the covariant derivative in the direction of the tangent vector along the path. And um, what we are differentiating is the vector field at the points in question. And that's just uh, this expression here. Remember that's from the top line. Then by the first axiom of an affine connection, these coefficient functions can be pulled in front because we have linearity with respect to this argument. So I'm pulling this in front. Now we have to covariantly differentiate the product of this scalar coefficient function and that vectorial term. So the covariant derivative of this scalar coefficient function times this vectorial term. Um, we carry this term forward and now we have this covariant derivative acting on the coefficient function, but that is just the ordinary derivative. Covariant derivative is the ordinary derivative when it acts on just functions. So we get d eta by dxk, ordinary derivative. Um, leaving that the same, plus by the product rule, we have to leave this the same and covariantly differentiate that, but that just gives us the expression with the Christoffel symbol. Here we can use the chain rule to see that this is simply d eta by dt. So we have this expression here. So the condition for a vector field to be such that its vectors are parallel translates of another along the path is that the coefficients of the vector field have to obey this condition here. And you see that it's first order in the derivative of eta, the eta coefficients, and then it's also just um, linear in those coefficients. And that's a set of first order differential equations. And um, with suitable assumptions about the smoothness of the coefficient functions like these, we can, one can show that there's always a solution at least for a finite range. So it's always possible to finitely parallel transport any vector that you want. So you choose at a particular point on the manifold a particular tangent vector eta. That gives you the initial conditions. And then this differential equation is first order. So it needs only one set of initial conditions, just the initial direction of your tangent vector. And then that tells you how the vector field has to be extended along the path such that the tangent vectors along the path are parallel translates of another. Okay, so if you're given a tangent vector at a point of a manifold and you want to know if I, want, if I parallel translate it along a certain path, what is it at some other point of the path? You have to solve that differential equation with the initial tangent vector as initial condition. Okay, so this is uh, to be true for all uh, i. These are just basis vectors, so it has to be true for all the coefficients, and that's this equation here. 
Okay, here I just wrote up what I already said in words. Um, there's a proposition. Of course, we don't go into the messy details, the exact details are for the conditions. Um, basically, smoothness. Given a path, gamma, from a certain finite interval into the manifold, so we have a finite length path, let's say, then the uh, autoparallel transport of a tangent vector field um, from a point gamma of t to another point gamma of s is unique. Uh, just because first order ODE, initial conditions, and if there's a solution, it's going to be unique. The upshot of this is that given a path in the manifold, this path defines a parallel transport map. Let's call this the parallel transport map tau. <coughs> so you can take a vector in the tangent space to a point gamma of t and map it into a vector in the tangent space of another point on the path gamma of s. <clears throat> so tau is a map from one tangent space on the manifold to another tangent space on the manifold. And this map is achieved by parallel transporting a vector here into a vector in that tangent space over there. This is the second time that we have a map from one tangent space, from a tangent space to one point on the manifold to the tangent space on another point on the manifold. Do you remember earlier when we had another map of that kind? Tangent space into tangent space. We got this map that stems from diffeomorphism. If you have a differentiable manifold and you consider a diffeomorphism, the manifold into itself, and every point of the manifold is mapped into another point of the manifold. And then by pullbacks and push forwards, this induces by precomposition also maps of the tangents, tangent vector space at one point into the tangent vector space at another point. It maps cotangent vectors into cotangent vectors and tensors into tensors by precomposition, not by parallel transport. It's a very different method. So here we map vectors in one tangent space to vectors in another tangent space about another point by parallel transporting the vectors um, along a path. Um, so um, a vector at the point gamma gets mapped into the vector at a point. Uh, a, a vector at the point gamma of t is mapped into a vector, a tangent vector at the point gamma of s. Remember what we did next when we, thinking back a few lectures, when we had the, a diffeomorphism of a manifold into itself, points were mapped into points by pullback and push forward, we had tangent vectors mapped into tangent vectors and so on. Then what we did is we used this to calculate the derivative. We said, hmm, we now have these pullback and push forward maps, which means that we now can compare a tensor at one point with a tensor at another point by using those pullback pull back and push forward maps. We can map them into the same vector space. Like we can choose a point here and then compare what the tensor is. We can compare the tensor with the tensor elsewhere by mapping that tensor elsewhere into the tensor space here, calculating the difference, dividing by the distance, and taking the limit for distance going to zero, that gives us a Newton-Leibniz definition of the derivative. That was the Newton-Leibniz definition of the Lie derivative, right? So if we choose to identify tangent spaces at different points and tensor spaces at different points through the push forwards and pullbacks induced by diffeomorphism, then the Newton-Leibniz derivative gives us the Lie derivative. Now we can do a very similar thing here. We have an identification of tensor spaces at different points we can use this to map a tensor, uh, a vec uh, sorry, a tangent space at another point to the tangent space at this point, write down a Newton-Leibniz limit, and the derivative that we get is 
the covariant derivative, as it should be. So we see another way in which the covariant derivative arises, not just it, we had introduced it algebraically as a linear map that obeys linearity in the first argument and product rule in, in the main argument, but we now can also define the covariant derivative, and I will skip the, uh, the proof for that. We can also define the covariant derivative as being the Newton Leibniz limit obtained by taking a uh, a tangent vector at one point minus the tangent vector at another point divided by the distance, letting the distance go to zero. So we take um, the, um, um, the, the vector field at a further away point and we map it back using the parallel transport map and we differentiate that map and that uh, at the point in question and that will also give us the covariant derivative. So the covariant derivative is geometrically infinitesimal parallel transport. It is the change of a vector field under infinitesimal parallel transport by construction. So we could have started with this definition instead of the algebraic one. Um, a little bit confusing. Didn't we uh, use the covariant derivative to define parallel transport? Yes. And it's no wonder if it's circular, yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, we defined the covariant derivative to define parallel transport, and then at the end we said, okay, if we have parallel transport, then we should, then we can define a Newton Leibniz limit, and we get a derivative, and we ask, what derivative is it? And then we see it's the covariant derivative. Yeah. Is this derivative independent of the path? Yeah, it applies for every path. It applies for every path. But you need to look at all paths in order to get all covariant derivatives. Yeah, the result of the parallel transport depends on the path. Yeah, because it depends on the, yeah. I mean, for the individual case, yes, it depends on which path you choose, because that gives you the direction in which you parallel transport. But in order to get the covariant derivative everywhere in all directions, you have to use paths that go everywhere in all directions. Okay, so far we have only been able to covariantly differentiate tangent vectors. We will need to, uh, to um, covariantly differentiate arbitrary tensors. So the parallel transport map, tau, which maps tangent vectors into tangent vectors by parallel transport, um, is the tool that we will use to generalize the covariant derivative to arbitrary tensors. Um, namely, we now define that the parallel transport map, it parallel transports co-vectors, cotangent vectors, by definition, in this way, such that whether you first evaluate a tangent against the cotangent vector and then parallel transport, or first parallel transport and then evaluate, that should be the same. <clears throat> so imagine you have a tangent vector and a cotangent vector. You can evaluate them on each other, and you get just a number. If you parallel transport the tangent vector, you get a tangent vector elsewhere. We define the parallel transport of the cotangent vector to this other place such that the parallel transported cotangent vector evaluating the parallel transported tangent vector gives you the same number. And that's supposed to be true for all tangent and cotangent vectors and all parallel transport. So this will uniquely already tell us how to parallel transport and therefore indirectly also how to covariantly differentiate cotangent vectors. And from that we will then be able to extend it also to arbitrary tensors. Let's see. So we extend the, uh, the parallel transport to tensor products um, straightforwardly. The parallel transport of 
Um, I mean, see, from this we will get how to parallel transport um, cotangent vectors. And generally, if we have any tensor product between tensors, the parallel transport of them will be the tensor product of the parallel transport. So we can then build it up. See, from this condition, we will we, we define how cotangent vectors are to be parallel transported. And then any tensor product of cotangent vectors and tangent vectors, so really any tensor, will be parallel transported by extending this definition by saying that the parallel transport of the tensor product is the tensor product of the parallel transport. Um, we can define then the definition, the, we can then define the covariant derivative of an arbitrary tensor in the Newton-Leibniz way. We don't have to do it this way, but just for completeness, I mean, in principle, everything is fixed already, but for completeness, let me um, point it out. So here's an arbitrary tensor now, could be a cotangent field or an arbitrary 5-3 tensor or something like this, and we want to covariantly differentiate it in this direction, in the direction of a vector field psi then this is the covariant derivative <coughs> in the direction of a tangent vector of a path going through the point P. Um, of this tangent vector field um, at, uh, at t equals zero, where we, where we parallel transported it to another point, right? So we have a tangent, uh, a tangent vector field here at a point. Here it is the tangent, the tangent, sorry, did I say tangent? A tensor field, a tensor field at the point P. This is the tensor field along the path. And we differentiate the tensor field along the path at the point P, namely at t equals zero. And that is the geometric definition of the covariant derivative of a tensor field. In other words, it's simply what you would expect. It's the infinite, it's the, it's the change of a tensor field under infinitesimal parallel transport. The tensor field along the path being simply the parallel transported version of what the tensor field is at, um, at a point. Um, where we have to choose the path such that the uh, that, the, that the tangent vector of the, uh, along the path at the point P matches the direction in which we want to differentiate. The same can be, the same as before can be done to get rid of the dependence on, on Xi. We can go from the covariant derivative in the direction of Xi to the absolute covariant derivative where we simply do not yet specify in which direction we want to differentiate. So the absolute covariant derivative of a tensor field S um, can take in, let's say it's a 3, 5 tensor. So it's threefold contravariant, fivefold covariant, which means that it can take three cotangent vector fields as input and five tangent vector fields as input. The absolute covariant derivative can take one more tangent field, tangent vector field as input. It's the one that identifies the direction in which we want to differentiate. So the covariant derivative of a general tensor field takes as input a bunch of um, tangent vector fields, a bunch of cotangent vector fields, and one more tangent vector field, the one that indicates in which direction we want to differentiate. And it's by definition simply the directional covariant derivative in the direction of xi of uh, s when you evaluate it only on the inputs that it normally takes. So what are the properties then? Let's collect some properties of the uh, covariant derivative. The covariant derivative is a derivation in the tensor, in the tensor space. And that's because it inherits that property. Ultimately, you can, you can um, uh, 
trace that back to the Leibniz rule um, that it uh, inherits from the differentiation along the path. So the covariant derivative of the tensor product of two tensors um, is, in the, according to the geometric definition, just the ordinary uh, derivative of um, um, the, the, ten, the tensor product of the tensor fields when you use the parallel transport map to identify um, different tensor spaces. And um, remember that the, that the parallel transport of the tensor product of two tensors is the tensor product of the parallel transport of the tensors. So now we see that when we apply that here on that, we have that it acts on this factor and it acts on that factor. And this is ordinary product rule because it's ordinary differentiation along the path. And so we get this product rule, which then translates by comparison to the original definition of what the covariant derivative is along a path into um, that which is the claim. This is the claim that the covariant derivative obeys the product rule. Um, we go back to equation C, which was here. Remember, we defined that the parallel transport of a cotangent vector field is such that the parallel transported cotangent vector field evaluating a parallel transported tangent vector field gives you the same as if you had not parallel tr transported them at all and you had evaluated the cotangent vector field on the vector field right away. This is telling us that parallel transport and evaluation of tangent vector on cotangent vector commute. Doesn't matter whether you first evaluate a cotangent vector on a tangent vector, and then parallel transport, or first parallel transport, and then evaluate. Doesn't matter. Let us translate that into the language of the covariant derivative. It means that whether you first covariantly differentiate and then contract indices, because this business is the contraction of indices, an upper index with, contracted with lower index. Whether you first contract indices and then apply the covariant derivative or the other way around, doesn't matter. That's what the equation C means. Um, we will use that in a moment. Oh, went too far. Uh, okay, right, so equation C implies that um, covariant differentiation and contractions um, do commute. Okay, so how um, does this all look like explicitly? Remember, remember that the covariant differentiation of a vector field, by definition, looked like this. Um, we can pull the coefficients xi i here in front because of the linearity axiom, um, because of the axiom that the covariant derivative is linear in the direction. And then the covariant derivative of this vector field is just given by uh, this coefficient matrix times the basis vectors again. We want to know now, given all these abstract things, what exactly is the covariant derivative then of this basis vector of the cotangent space? And by extension, what is the covariant derivative of the basis vectors um, of any tensor uh, space and any tensor? For that purpose, let us consider the tensor product of a tangent vector and a cotangent vector. So this is a one-one tensor, one-fold contravariant, one-fold covariant. The covariant derivative of it, covariant derivative of this one-one tensor here, is by the Leibniz rule, which we just established, the covariant derivative of, of the first factor, tensor the second plus, and the other way around. Now, remember equation C and the fact that contraction commutes with covariant differentiation. Let us contract 
So let us evaluate omega on eta, or eta on omega. So let us now first contract and then covariantly differentiate. So we have omega evaluating eta, and that is just a function. It's just a number at a point. It's a function on the manifold, the scalar function. And the covariant derivative on a scalar function is just the ordinary directional derivative. We just apply the vector field on that scalar function. So it's psi of omega of eta. And that is the same as if we first covariantly differentiated and then contracted. You see, here we first contracted and then do the covariant der derivative. And now here, we first covariantly differentiate the eta tensor, tensor omega. And now, once we have that, let's contract it. So let's apply that to this. Let's apply that to this. You see, it's always tangent vector, cotangent vector, tangent vector, cotangent vector. Let's apply them to each other. So we have omega of this, just this applied to that, or that applied to this, it's the same thing. And same here, this applied to that. Okay, so this equation is just expresses, it doesn't matter whether you first contract indices and then covariantly differentiate, or first covariantly differentiate and then contract indices. I mean, by contract indices, I mean evaluate the tangent vector on a cotangent vector. So, the full equation is, because this is just that, the full equation is psi of omega of eta is equal to this, just carrying this forward. Um, well, what we're really after is this. What is the covariant derivative of a, of a cotangent vector? So let's solve for that. So we just put this on that side and this on that side, we get this equation here. The as yet unknown, the as yet to be determined covariant derivative of a cotangent vector evaluated on eta is given by this expression minus that expression. It's just exactly this equation reshuffled a little bit <coughs> by putting this on one side. OK, now let's look at it exactly in a, what exactly it does for a particular basis. So let's choose for omega and eta particular basis vectors, namely the one that come with a chart. So omega is the canonical basis in the cotangent space. Eta is the canonical basis in the tangent space. And then this equation becomes that equation. So we have covariant derivative of omega, so covariant derivative of dxj. This is the thing we want to find out about. What is that? The covariant derivative of a cotangent vector evaluated on a tangent vector is equal to the psi. And then here we have the evaluation of omega on eta, which is to say the evaluation of dxj on d by dxi. And I'm using here a notation that um, is sometimes convenient. Um, here it's not yet super urgent to use that notation, but um, when you have larger expressions, it's a good notation. So here we are evaluating a tangent vector on a cotangent vector, or cotangent vector on a tangent vector. This is like in quantum mechanics, when you have a bra and a ket vector space and dual vector space. So in differential geometry too, sometimes we use the notation that if you have a cotangent vector to be evaluated on a tangent vector, then we write it in a bracket notation. Remember the inner product that we had earlier, the inner product for differential forms. <coughs> this is, an, this is um, similar here. Here we have a bracket notation where this is a, tangent, a cotangent vector, this is a tangent vector, and we write it in this way. So in this case here, we have omega evaluated on eta, which is a bracket where omega is on the left and eta on the right. In this particular case, the omega is, d by d, is dxj and the eta is d by dxi. So we have this bracket notation here. Of course, in this case, it's pretty trivial. What we get is just a Kronecker delta ij. Well, in here, we have this um, cotangent vector field evaluating that tangent vector field. 
So the omega is the xj, okay? And remember, the evaluation of the cotangent vector on the, vent on the vector field is again in this bracket notation, this. Um, and here we have the uh, a tangent vector field, which with this choice of basis is just given by the um, covariant derivative of d by dxi. And we can spell that out in the next line. First of all, this term carries forward as zero because that's just the Kronecker delta. Dual basis evaluates to a Kronecker delta, which is constant. And so the direction of the derivative of a constant is, of course, zero. And this term here, we can spell out further. The dxj is just carried forward. And that we can evaluate. The xi i coefficients can be pulled in front. Gives us the xi l here. And then we have just uh, the d by dx um, uh, j here and d by dx i. That gives us the Christoffel simple expression. Now, the bracket we can easily evaluate dxj d by dxk is just a Kronecker delta. And so that becomes this. You see, we saw that if we saw one instance of why the bracket notation is quite good, the alternative to the bracket notation would have been to say, to write here dxj and then within brackets that argument, or this and within brackets that argument. It just becomes a bit tedious if the thing is a little lengthy, like, like this expression. Okay, so this is what we were looking for. The covariant derivative of a cotangent vector evaluated on a tangent vector, and we chose the basis in particular, gives us this. It's the xi l coefficients of the direction vector here, and then uh, these coefficients here. So therefore, if we don't evaluate the covariant derivative of a cotangent vector on a tangent vector, then, I mean, if we evaluate it on a tangent vector, we just get numbers. If we don't evaluate it on that, then we get something that's um, proportional to the dxi with those coefficients here. Okay, so that is what we were after. The covariant derivative of the cotangent vector is, of, of this particular cotangent vector field, is this. Uh, quite similar to what the covariant derivative is of a d by dx a, d, d by dx i, but there we would have a plus sign, and of course the index structure would be different because here we have an upper index, d by dx j has a lower index. Okay, what, what do we get for general tensors? Um, uh, I won't go into all the details, but um, the strategy is very similar. Remember the equation star. We, we started by saying that um, if, we, if we first evaluate a cotangent vector on a tangent vector and then calculate the covariant derivative, we get the same as if we first covariantly differentiate and then evaluate them on, it, on each other. That was this equation. And then we said, this is the term we are interested in because it's a covariant derivative of a cotangent vector. So let's solve the equation for that and plug in the basis vectors. d by dxi, dxj, and that's how we got our answer. A generalization is this. Imagine we don't just have a cotangent vector that evaluates on a tangent vector, but instead we have an R-fold covariant, S-fold contravariant tensor here. And it evaluates on R tangent vectors and S cotangent vectors to a number. Then again, whether we first evaluate and contract everything and then calculate the covariant derivative, or first use the Leibniz rule to work out all the covariant derivatives and then contract them all onto each other, that's got to be the same because that's how parallel transport is defined. That's how parallel transport for covectors and general tensors is defined. So we get the same thing. And then equation star, 
where the as yet unknown to be determined covariant derivative is expressed in terms of this scalar, uh, this, this derivative on the scalar minus um, those, um, um, but well, the other term, the, the term that remains, um, that becomes, in the case of general tensors, uh, this length equation, where you have the covariant derivative of a general tensor in the direction of chi. The thing that we are interested in is given by the ordinary derivative acting on that scalar here, where everything is evaluated. This tensor is completely satisfied. All of its slots are filled. All of the, uh, if it's R-fold covariant, it has R tangent vectors. And if it's S-fold contravariant, it has S cotangent vectors in there. So that the whole thing becomes scalar. And then we have minus all those terms that we would get from, or that we will get from the Leibniz rule. And then if you plug in the basis vectors dxi and d by dxj, going through the same tedious calculation as what we had earlier, then you find that the covariant derivative of the tensor field um, is this. You get uh, psi k, and then um, the, um, I mean, psi k, you can always pull in front because of the linearity, the first axiom for covariant derivative. And then the coefficients of the covariantly differentiated tensor, indicated by semicolon. And then we have the then we have the uh, the tens the basis of cotan of tangent vectors and the basis of of tangent vectors to build it up in the to build this up in the um, in the tensor space the appropriate tensor space. So if this was an R S tensor, its covariant derivative is still an R S tensor, just like the covariant derivative of a vector field is a vector field. The covariant derivative of a cotangent field is a cotangent field. Where the coefficient matrix, this thing with the semicolon here now, is given by taking the original uh, tensor coefficient function and ordinarily differentiating it. So that's not a semicolon, just an ordinary comma. And then we get positive terms with Christopher symbols for the contravariant indices, one for every contravariant index. And we get those negative terms for every covariant index. In the case where our tensor is just a tangent vector field, this formula reduces to what we had for tangent vectors. In the case where the tensor S is just a cotangent vector field, it reduces to the formula that we just got for the tangent vector fields. Namely, these are the two special cases. Um, I'm sure you've seen that before in a, in a previous course on on GR. Okay, so what we see here is that the upshot of all of this is that once you've specified an affine connection, once you've specified uh, a covariant derivative, you have specified parallel transport. And well, we haven't done it yet, but given parallel transport, we can now check whether or not a manifold has curvature or not. We can define a notion of curvature through, non through the potential non-triviality of parallel transport. And it turns out that not only will we get curvature this way, we will also get another notion, the notion of torsion. That's actually one of the next things that we'll do. It turns out that the manifold cannot only be curved, it can also have, have torsion. Uh, it depends on what uh, properties our um, affine connection has. And then eventually, once we've expressed the non-triviality of the shape of a manifold in terms of the affine connection, we will then establish a connection to the metric. How can we make sure that, how can we express the same shape equivalently, either through a metric, that is by specifying non-trivial distances, or equivalently by specifying non-trivial parallel transport. And there will be other methods to, um, um, to describe the non-trivial shape of a manifold. And the essay will be about, you know, give a brief overview of what methods there are. 
and then maybe focus on one or the other. Keep in mind that nobody knows which is the right method for quantizing gravity. The obvious choices have been tried for 100 years. <laughs> it's been pretty much 100 years now. DR is, is 100 years old. Right, OK, there's one more slide, but um, we are over time, and I'd better do this carefully uh, next time. Remember that we don't have a lecture on Monday, I think. There's Thanksgiving coming up this coming Monday. Um, so I see you in a week then. <laughs>